Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Hamid Haroun, who is a Purple Light Up Ambassador. Um, as you know, Access Chat are also supporting Purple Light Up, uh, which takes place on Monday the 3rd of December. This is a day of celebration for International Day for Persons with Disabilities, UN Day for Persons with Disabilities. Hugely important that we do celebrate. Um, so welcome, Hamid. It's great to have you with us. You Not only do you have a PhD in biomedical magnetic resonance imaging, which is a mouthful, <laughs> but you're the chair of the University's Disabled Staff Network and you launched the National Association of Disabled Staff Networks, which is uh, you know, an important thing in itself. So it's great to have you with us. Really uh, pleased to have you here today. Um, can you tell us a bit about your journey in this space and how you ended up doing all of these wonderful things? <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Neil uh, and uh, Anthony, for having me uh, on this program. I've watched so many of your extracts. Uh, um, your know, access charts and it's like <clears throat> being on TV is just amazing. It's like eat your heart out BBC and ITV. This is better. So uh, um, really, the, the journey started from uh, my birth. I've been disabled since uh, birth and uh, had experiences throughout my life um, that really cha shaped it. So I started life in like a, a special school. Uh, for disabled children um, in Didsbury, which is a lovely part of Manchester, very green, very gorgeous. Um, but um, in that school, because it was a special school, there was no like uh, push academically. So <clears throat> everything was more around our physical well-being. We did like wheelchair dancing, sports competitions, all sorts of great things like that. But academically, there was not push there. So I was really lucky, though, um, when I got to the age of uh, um, going, starting our high school, uh, there was um, an integration scheme started in Manchester. And I went to one of the first high schools in Manchester that uh, actually had access for disabled children to go there. So I went to this high school and it was just incredible. It was one of the roughest high schools in Manchester but it opened my eyes to the real world um, and what life was really all about. Um, and that's where I really learned about science and started watching amazing programs like Tomorrow's World. Do you guys remember Tomorrow's World? Yeah, I do. I, I, I actually, um, it was amazing. We, I uh, saw Maggie Philbin the other week at an really? event. So, yeah, so oh, yeah, Tomorrow's fun. World, top top of the agenda. They're, you know they're doing a, a comeback show, 35 year anniversary show. Really? Coming up soon, yes. Oh yes, we're gonna see that. Um, and Star Trek and uh, just amazing programs like that, that I used to watch. So they inspired me into science. Um, and I really like Dr. McCoy, if you've ever watched Star Trek, right? Uh, Dr. McCoy has this probe thing uh, and he waves it over a person and finds out what their problem is gives them a pill and they're cured instantly. So I thought, yeah, I want to become a doctor. But when I went for careers advice, they just put me off. It was like, no, you're a wheelchair user. You've got physical disabilities. There's no way you can become a doctor. So I'll think of something else. So um, when I told my mom, she said, ah, oh, never mind. You can become a lawyer instead. I'm like, no, I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> Why do I want to do something so dry? <laughs> uh, I'm helping criminals as well, God. So, um, yeah, I kind of um, followed my passion into science, went for A levels, and on the, the shelf of my uh, teacher's room, there was a book there on medical physics. So, that was kind of like a, a divine inspiration that, okay, if I can't make it as a medical doctor, I can at least get in. Well, uh, through science, through physics, get into the medical field that way. So I followed that path, went to university, got to university, and I just found access was so bad, so difficult for disabled students that I couldn't even access the students union, which is where everything went on at the university. So I decided to do a bungee jump. Uh, and I did that on the side of the main road in Manchester. I don't know if you know Manchester very well, but Oxford Road is where like all the university life happens. 
So it was just on the side of Oxford Road where this bungee jumping was going on. Uh, the Students' Union um, kind of organised it. And I did it in my wheelchair, went up 180 foot, but without my glasses, so I couldn't say anything. <laughs> and did the bungee jump from there. But it was just a fantastic thing to do. I'd never, ever do it again in my life. But it was it was brilliant because it kind of rose it, it raised awareness that disabled people can do anything you know we can follow our passions we can do our dreams but you know um and that kind of woke up the university to actually thinking about access more seriously for disabled students at the university and i got into magazines and newspapers and all sorts of things so it was, it was brilliant so yeah that was kind of my first disabled activism but at high school my high school teacher she was also disabled and she used to chain herself to buses that were inaccessible she got set, taken to prison by the police but because the prison cells were inaccessible she couldn't even be put in a prison cell <laughs> so it was like her stories really kind of fired me up and said yeah we need to uh, keep raising awareness so that's where I kind of my kind of uh, part in disability activism if you like started um, and things carried on from there. Fantastic. Antonio, I know you've got a question. Yeah, I do. No, uh, no. Uh, visiting in, in all your uh, adventures, <laughs> I would say that, uh, how, how would that reflect today on the experience that students have when they apply for the university in Manchester? So I think things are much better now access is uh, improved for disabled students and in fact there's a lot of attention on disabled students and uh, the provisions there are at university um, but now there are problems in terms of funding funding for support for disabled students so there was the disabled students allowance and uh, in recent years the government has cut what that allowance can provide support for um, and you know who it can go to and that's causing a lot of problems for disabled students causing problems in terms of accessing education uh, but there's a lot of good good things that have happened as well so technology is um, amazing the the kind of lecture recordings um, and um, yeah that those kind of systems are, are making education more accessible distance learning as well is uh, becoming more um, uh, kind of fashionable if you like more uh, universities are providing that so that kind of opens the doors for a lot of disabled people to participate in education uh, so yeah i'd say things are much better now but there's still um, a lot to do excellent thank you um Obviously, we're talking about purple light up today. So, w what are you doing um, to to what are you lighting up purple, and, and what are you doing to celebrate IPWD? Well, IDPWD. That's a real problem for someone with dyslexia. I can tell you. <laughs> well, me personally, I'm I'm uh, going to be turning my beard purple. So I don't know if you can see the purple in the beard, right? Fantastic. Uh, and there are lots of events happening at universities across the country uh, to take part in the Purple Light Up. It's an incredible initiative that Kate Nash uh, and the team at Purple Space have, uh, uh, you know, uh, taken off the ground. Um, there's such a vibe, such an energy um, of disabled people everywhere to get involved in the purple light up and of course this year is going global as well so not just celebrating in this country but all over the world and it's just a, a brilliant way it's a magnificent way even of celebrating the international day of disabled people um, and just a great way to pull us all together and the whole kind of purple identity as well rather than using the wheelchair symbol a very few people are actually wheelchair users why use that symbol so purple in in uh, the purple pound, purple talent, purple passion, and purple symbolising disabled people, and the positivity around that as well. So getting us away from this deficit model of disability or disabled people being these poor people who are on benefits, sitting at home doing nothing. No, we're making a huge contribution 
uh, to the economy uh, here and all over the world, but people just don't know uh, about it. So it's raising that awareness and the positivity. I think it's a, it's just a brilliant thing. I love, I love it, love it completely. So yeah, there's lots going on, lots of purple things happening. People trying to light up their buildings in purple. Uh, making purple cakes, purple food, purple salads. There's all sorts of uh, purple mm. things all over the place. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we've definitely got some purple cake action going on. Um, yeah. We've we've we we managed to persuade our branding team to turn our website purple. Yes. <laughs> so so I think that's like something like thirty thousand web pages will all go purple for the day. Um, I like so 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 that's that's pretty cool we've done our um sort of powerpoint templates and the whole works and so that so that's going to be fun and we're having an event in our in our london headquarters as well so so um we're going for it this year it's great that they've actually got it on a weekday yeah makes life a lot easier <laughs> hey we're going to celebrate this on sunday oh. <laughs> But also what we've done, Neil, is yeah. uh, we've got this time uh, the Purple Light Up team, they wanted mm. uh, senior champions to make yes. uh, vlogs. So we've got uh, a professor, a STEAM professor at the University of Leeds, who's the director of the Centre for Disability Studies there. Um, her name is Anna Lawson. So she's made uh, a short one minute vlog for us as well, which is fantastic. And that really represents the uh, passion of our sector to be involved uh, in purple light up, which is brilliant. Excellent, uh, and and uh, we've 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 got um, well, we were planning to have Deborah, but um, unfortunately, Deborah's had uh, family issues to deal with, and her, her daughter Sarah's been very ill, and and so we're not having Deborah in person, which is a shame. But we'll 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 find another opportunity for that. But we have got. Um, I've got Alistair Somerville coming down and, and talking. He he's the guy behind Acuity Design, and he does all sorts of stuff uh, around, uh, you know, thinking about how you can deliver accessible experiences in a different way. So it's not all about standards, but he does tactile UX and museum design. It's so going to be really ex exciting to hear from him. He's uh, someone that we've had on before, as well. We talked a little bit about celebration. Um, why is it so important for us to celebrate our identities on a day like the the third of December? Be because uh, you know it's it's not something that happens often. Why do you think it's so important? I think it's really important, and especially on a day that is supposed to be the International Day of Disabled People. Before I found out about that day, you know, I I never actually heard anything happening on that day to bring disabled people together. So uh, years ago, before the Purple Light Up came on, a few years before that, we started uh, having some events at the university to raise awareness of the day um, and celebrations around that. Uh, and it was like the first time our universities anyway um, had even heard of the occasion. So it's really important to take up this opportunity, this one one day in the year, to actually talk positively about disabled people, again, to get away from that deficit um, kind of attitude around disabled people, and to to talk about the uh, hidden disabilities as well. So, well, hidden impairments, invisible disabilities, I think is so important. There are people out there who are, you know, they, they work really hard, so hard, so much harder than non-disabled people, and their disabilities are invisible. You know, other people can't can't see them. People with mental health problems, people with um, uh, diabetes and chronic illnesses of some kind. Uh, you know, really working hard, contributing so much, and it's like just raising awareness of that, making people realise, um, you know, the the contribution disabled people make to the economy, and you know. <laughs> And the, the support as well that disabled people need to be able to do that. So without the support I get, for instance, from access to work, I would be just stranded at home. I wouldn't be able to go to work. I wouldn't be able to do what I do. So it's about really kind of recognizing that 
uh, and uh, getting support from um, non-disabled people as well. Everybody joining in in this celebration together. So, uh, you know, you know, uh, going back to, to to your words, you know, how do you think that you know, uh, employee networks can can uh, support staff, and you know, and, and find ways where they can they can be uh, more effective and, and achieve full potential at work. So say that again. You want examples? How, how can you? How do you see the the, the importance of employee networks support the individual in order to achieve their their own full potential? Oh wow, uh, networks. So one person raising their voice and saying something in an organization is so easy to dismiss. It's just a bit of noise in the background. But when there's a network of people, where there's a whole group of people together, the power is so much stronger. And as well, to bring people together, that sense of community, uh, you kind of um, get support from each other. It's that peer support, it's that thing that people, with disabilities, there's that shared kind of uh, experience that we need to share um, and helping each other as well to make it to the go those goals, kind of egging each other on and saying, yeah, you can do it. You know, don't don't be pulled back by this and that. And giving each other advice, signposting the things that have helped us uh, in, our, uh, in our lives in reaching our goals, how they can help other people as well do the same thing, I think, is um, an incredible kind of strength of networks uh, and why they're so important to be there. And exactly why our Disabled Staff Network at, at the university, how it kind of started off, how it brought people together. The, the only trouble with Disabled Staff Networks is the word disabled, that there are a lot of people out there with disabilities uh, who don't identify as being disabled. But they do have, uh, or they are disabled, uh, and it's, it, I don't know, the, there's kind of that thing around that word as well, and, and bringing people together. But it's also trying to get the institutions to uh, support disabled people more. Uh, so, um, yeah, kind of this whole idea of declaration and disclosure and stuff like that and why it's so important to do it because so many people kind of think well why should i tell my employer that i'm disabled what am i going to get from it is it just going to cause me more trouble uh, than anything but being a network you can get your organization do things to support those disabled staff uh, and give them the reason to come out and and say they have a disability that they're disabled. So there's a lot of strengths behind networks, I believe. So, so I obviously really allies yeah. play an important role on that. Allies play, play a very powerful role. Allies, uh, so an ally that we had at the university uh, was a senior champion, so uh, a member of the senior leadership team at the university, and they had no experience of disability, which was incredible that they kind of accepted the role of being our ally, uh, of being our champion, in fact, uh, but having no background, having no experience of disability, but coming to our meetings, coming and sitting into to our meetings, listening to the conversations, coming to events even and opening them for us, it was a huge learning experience for them. And they actually realized how related they were themselves to disability. Uh, that they found, they they realized that there were disabled people in their own family uh, that they they didn't realize were disabled, um, and coming to our meetings and events and and really it was yeah like I said a huge learning curve for them uh, to realize you know uh, the the problems we face and the solutions we want at work to be ourselves uh, and do the best we can. So having allies is so important because. We know what our stories are, but we need to be able to get them across to, to those who can provide the, the systems and support that we need. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think allies are tremendously important. We're working at the moment to expand our ally network across all of our, uh, our networks. I, I think the point that you raised about um, 
disability sometimes being off-putting to, to people joining in because people don't consider themselves to be disabled is is a tricky one it's it's one that we've tried to address but we've called our uh, our network adapt because we have to adapt to uh, our environment and we're helping our company adapt to meeting our needs as well so um, we thought about ability and we thought about this and and in the end it's really about having that kind of flexibility to make sure that that, that we're enabling people to be their best selves um, that, that's 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 really key key to it and we and we do want to be attractive and we do want to attract allies and part of that power of the networks is demystifying disability, demystifying long-term health conditions, which people don't necessarily think of as being disability, but that are classified as being, um, because there's one thing to have the legal definition, uh, which is sort of an umbrella that protects us and gives us the, the rights and benefits that, that enable us to participate. And it's another thing altogether to have it as part of your identity so um so so we, we we wanted to be able to talk about this and do it in in a non-threatening way and i think that um perhaps you know days like purple light up are a, a golden opportunity or is that a purple opportunity for us to be able to talk about these things and, and engage people that perhaps would like to be allies but that are somewhat discouraged by the taboos around disability so how are, what are the things that, that you if you could change one thing around disability um, relating towards disability in some way what would it be <laughs> so only uh, one you're only allowed one <laughs> I'm gonna make it really tough man um, I would say attitude I think the, the attitudes yeah. towards disabled people is the biggest thing I want to change. Mm. Um, so, uh, personally, right, uh, my my own kind of upbringing as a uh, Pakistani in a in a family, um, you know. Uh, so my family have always pushed me to do my best and always been supportive to me. But in the in the culture of the people of my community. It's like disability is always such a negative, you know, like poor thing, you know, what's it going to do with his life? And, you know, um, you know, we it, almost like begging forgiveness from God that we don't want to get the punishment he's facing or something like that. So it's um, changing that attitude, taking disability as a positive thing. Disability, you know, at university, um, you go on a course and you learn uh, you know, you learn whatever you're learning, law or medicine or dentistry or whatever <clears throat> course you choose to do. But they talk about transferable skills. So disability, for me anyway, gives me so many transferable skills in terms of time management, in terms of confidence, in terms of like um, uh, being organized. Yeah, I have to be organized, otherwise I can't get through my day. There's so many skills that disabled person has that non-disabled people just don't get. So, uh, you know, disability, there's such a positivity, is such a vibe. I've forgotten now the question you asked me, but yeah, that kind of thing. No, 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 that's great. That's a great quote, actually. I'm, I'm going to have to steal that from you. Uh, well, no, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, I'll give you attribution on that one, but uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great quote. So, um, so, so um, it's dipping in, going to create a meme now for for that. So, um, but absolutely, we, um, as we're talking about accessibility and disability within our own organisation and within my role as, as the accessibility lead for uh, my employer, I think it's it's a focus on what people with disabilities can bring in terms of innovation and what the the disability tech has brought to a wider society that has benefited everyone. You you look at, at all of the stuff that people are using in, in technology day to day now. I've been shouting at computers for 20 years. You know, uh, speech recognition is not a new thing. Yeah. It's a lot better, but it's not a new thing. Um, 
They didn't used to shout back, though. So, 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 so you, are, you are in a better relationship now. Yeah, yeah, it's less abusive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah exactly and like you know if you go to so i've heard so many people go to an interview they they kind of are open about their disability and the interviewer will say to them well how are you going to do the job with the disability you have but that's like so such a, a wrong attitude to have again it's changing attitudes so it's like I, I know people who are totally deaf who play the most beautiful beautiful music there are, there is professors like esteemed high world leading professors who are blind and their expertise is in textile uh, sciences you know material sciences and stuff you know i can't imagine how they do these things but they do because they have those skills they have those talents um, you know, uh, people like Stephen Hawking, for instance, the famous professor at Cambridge, the late Stephen Hawking, and the science he did, what an amazing mind, right? Um, you know, if, I don't know, words can't express how, how amazing those people are. Those are role models. Those are incredible people. Uh, but like, you know, for people to go to an interview and the interviewer is saying to them, how are you going to do this job? With your disability it's just like yeah we've got to change that <laughs> yeah. that's just so, so wrong so, so it's fine to ask how are you going to do this job the last part of the sentence needs to go mm. because exactly. <laughs> yeah it's like how are you going to do the job well i'm going to approach it this way great fantastic and i'm going to do a damn good job of it but, but rather than how are you going to do the job the yeah, question is that how can we yeah. support you to do this? Yes. Oh, sure. But 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 I'm talking about interview questions. You know, we should ask everyone, how are you going to do the job, regardless yeah, yeah, sure. of whether or not. But yeah, absolutely. It, it's like you've declared a disability. How can we support you to do that to the best exactly. to the best of our, our our capabilities as an organisation, and to help you be uh, you know the best you can in doing the job. It doesn't cost much. If anything, um, you know, we look at all of these things, you know, access to work, it's revenue positive for the government. We need to exactly. stop thinking about not only the deficit model of disability uh, in humans, but the deficit model of funding disability. Because actually, when we do invest in it, it's an investment, not, not, not a gift, it's not charity, it's an investment. Exactly. We're contributing to the wider economy. That's right. And that's exactly. something that we really need to understand because actually we're we're benefiting uh, the economy. Every pound that we put in is one pound twenty back to the treasury. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Not many. Not many things that we spend money on as a country give that yeah. kind of return. <laughs> exactly. You know, in in property they say you know if you get a six to seven percent return you're doing well. Mm. But if you invest in disability you're getting three times that. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> Makes sense to us, doesn't it? It's just getting that message through. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But you know, when you yeah. talk about, you talked about allies before. Yes. So one huge ally, I think in um, our history, um, I don't know if he was disabled himself or not, but Alf Morris, do you remember Alf Morris? Yeah, um, I know the name. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry, that's my wife behind that. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, Alf Morris was the first minister for disabled people. He was a Manchester MP as well, which we're very proud of. But, you know, the, the changes he made in society, the legislation, the rights for disabled people, the whole motability scheme that he started up, um, and all the different programs he did to support disabled people, were incredible so I'm sorry I just wanted to get that in there <laughs> no, no 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 that's quite all right yeah, just a couple of years ago we had our first um, kind of public lecture at our university that was focused on disability equality so we we have lectures on all sorts of things at the university obviously but this was the the first public lecture this was back in 2016 um, when we had our first public lecture that was focusing on disability equality and we had the amazing Tani Gray Thompson come and uh, uh, give the lecture. He was incredible as well. Uh, and we had a 
a Q and A panel and stuff like that. But just to remember what Alf Morris uh, did at that time, and the legislation we have now kind of started where, where you know from the work he did at that time. Again, I don't know if he was disabled or not, but he was a huge ally for for the disabled community, definitely, and a huge role role model as well. And of course, Tony Gray Thompson, man, he's powerhouse, absolutely incredible person. Yeah, I I keep trying to persuade her to come on Access Chat. <laughs> One of these days, we'll we'll snag her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, we can talk about transport. Because I've I've engaged with her on a few conversations about the the difficulties of travelling, um, particularly on rail and so on, with uh, and 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 the the frustrations of um, having to book stuff in advance and you know yeah. just yeah. how we you know we fail basic things to enable people to get from A to B um, right. yeah, with dignity. Um, it's yeah. uh, it's great that Kate that Nash has actually got uh, network rail involved in the purple light up. So some uh, stations, I think Houston and other stations, are going to light up purple. So um, maybe Tani should go on some trains at that time and <laughs> see if there's any better on that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I think there's you know there's basic things that we can do, and I think there's things that we can do with data that can make things better too so mm -hmm. for example um you know toilet information you know simple yep. things like this you know telling people in advance if you know if if the disabled toilets aren't working on certain carriages you know you should be able to more dynamically book the fact that you have to book 24 hours in advance is you know, is, is is putting you at a at a significant yeah. disadvantage. You don't have the same kind of, uh, you you mentioned you you know your ability to plan. Well, it's driven by things like this, right? It's, exactly. It's driven by the 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 fact that the logistics of travelling whilst disabled That's are significantly right. more complex. Yeah. So, but 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 we have the technology, we have the data, we need to be able to look at ways of applying this to yeah. to make it easier and you know take some of the pain out of the logistics that that's uh, that's that, that are currently there um and and then of course there will be the knock-on benefits for everyone else because of course we're leading the way here absolutely <laughs> but also uh, on the subject of travel so i'm really happy to see that something's happening in parliament on mm -hmm. uh, flat uh, about flights and the way that disabled people's equipment, especially wheelchairs and stuff, are just like thrown on uh, into the cargo in airplanes. And you, you get to your destination and they're usually broken or, you know, um, in some kind of bad condition, you can't even use them when you get to your destination. So I think something's happening in Parliament right now around, uh, you know, making that illegal, I think, to, uh, um, like um, mistreat disabled people's equipment in that way, um, which I hope something happens on that, because that's always my fear when I go on a flight, is what condition I'm going to find my wheelchair in on the other side. And being yeah. a powered wheelchair as well, anything could go wrong with it if you just chuck it into the cargo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, right. it, 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 it... It would be good to be able to enable people to just wheel onto the plane. To be honest, okay. we have those space. We have those spaces on buses. We have them on trains. What is it so difficult about planes? It's of course you have to secure. Yeah. Uh, it, you know because of turbulence or whatever. It's not beyond the wit of man, is it? It really exactly. isn't. Exactly. That would be yeah. amazing if that could happen. Yeah. Well, it would certainly solve the the sort of you know throwing something that is as delicate as a an egg into yep. the hold. Exactly. Except you can easily source eggs, and they don't come from specialist suppliers, <laughs> and they don't cost tens of thousands of pounds to repair. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, I know I'm 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 totally with you on that. Um, I, Antonio, do you have any further questions? <laughs> No, you know, we have a, we have similar problems when, when in Ireland in terms of in terms of in terms of transportation. 
the, the, the fact that we're able to bring some Irish organizations to purple light is quite an interesting win to, to generate awareness. So I'm quite happy for that to be happening. So it will happen in Dublin and Cork and probably in other cities around uh, because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great moment to, to bring everyone on board of this, of this event. Absolutely. So um, I haven't mentioned yet the, the National Association of Disabled Staff Networks, which we started here in Manchester in 2014, some years ago. So we've been going for four or five years now. Um, and uh, it's a, it, it's trying to like be a, a, well, it's a super network connecting together disabled staff networks at uh, universities and colleges um, across the country, across the UK. Uh, but we also have some universities outside the UK. So in Dublin, in fact, uh, um, there's a university there. University College Dublin is, is part of uh, the National Association. We've even got universities out in Canada who are part of the, the National Association, which is fantastic. But again, it's it's the, the National Association. We're trying to learn from each other, share good practice, learn from each other's experiences, uh, because in the early days of our disabled staff network in Manchester, we were contacted by like newer networks, trying to find out how we did things, you know, how we made changes at the university, how we uh, made influence in policies and stuff like that. So the National Association was really born out of that need to share those resources, to share uh, those practices amongst us. Uh, and it's a fantastic, fantastic organization uh, to be uh, in, uh, and again, the kind of inspiration, inspiration is weird, that's so like overused, I think, but it still means to me what it's supposed to. So uh, to be inspired and to be so motivated and moved by all the people that I get to meet as well in the association, all sorts of disabled people with all sorts of impairments, making such a, a huge contribution. Again, that, that purple light up, that purple, passion that's out there. It's out there and uh, uh, Purple Light Up is a great way to raise awareness of that. Uh, uh, it's just fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been a, a real pleasure chatting with you today. Um, it's been a giggle, in fact. So um, <laughs> Indeed. Uh, I think we just need uh, all that remains is for us to thank uh, our, our friends and supporters, um, Barclays Access and my clear text because they are constant companions and supporters and help keep the lights on and keep us captioned and enable us to do stuff so it's really important to have those kind of people supporting you um, and to say thank you once again Hamid it's been a real pleasure look forward to chatting with you on Twitter thank you very much Neil thank you Antonio as well thank you very much Great to have you. Bye -bye.